So yeah, I'm Claire Stanley Manick. I'm the Paid Media Director at Connective 3. Um, and to cover off some of the topics that I guess some of the other guys have touched on, which is great because it means that we're not all saying conflicting things, Google are black boxing everything. So with the launch of Pmax and Demand Gen, they're just re removing the levers that we have. So gone are the good old days of like bid adjustments and location adjustments and things, and we have to sort of rely on the algorithm and the machines. And that's all very well and good when the machines work well, but when the machines go wrong, it's a little bit of a different story. So how can we control the AI? Well, first off, AI isn't new, but what it will do is it will give you the competitive advantage if you learn how to sort of manipulate it to what your, um, what's most important to your business. And to follow on from what Chris was saying, that's so important, and this whole thing is about what's most important to you and make sure that you get more of what's valuable. So, some stats that Google talk about a lot, if you've ever been to one of their conferences recently, you'll have heard both of these stats before. So, 15% of all searches on you every day, and they've been saying that for years and apparently it's still true. And on top of that, keyword, sorry, search queries with five or more keywords in the search query are increasing or growing 5x, five times uh, faster, five times a year, and it's a lot faster than shorter keywords. So what that tells us is we're all doing much, much longer searches. And how can we possibly account for all of those in our exact match uh, keywords and all our structures? And obviously AI is the answer to that. So we get asked a lot in our agency and especially by our um, investor, it's like, what are we doing in AI? And the fact is, we've been doing AI and using machine learning for absolutely years. So things like smart bidding, that's AI, that's machine learning. You've got broad match, uh, the Google tag, uh, and, and even enhanced CPC. Um, Data-driven attribution, keyword planner, planner, performance planner, they're all just machine learning and things. But we have got some, that some things that are a bit newer. So PMAC, demand gen have already been mentioned. Um, you've got things like the video creation and the generative AI side of things. Um, and then, of course, you've got the privacy space, which we all love, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, consent mode, enhanced conversion, it's all modeled. It's all machine learning, it's all AI. So, um, AI is amazing, but if you don't control it, it'll just run riot. It'll just be like sheep in a field or out of the field that just go absolutely crazy. But once you've got those parameters, put in, once you've got the signals where you tell Google what success looks like and what's most important to you, then you can just let it roam free. And that's where you get the real magic. So I think I've got five, maybe six top tips for you. So the first one is work out what's most valuable to you. Not all conversions are equal. So in this example here, we've got, if you can see at the back there, we have a laptop that's worth 600 quid from an average order value and some headphones that are worth 50 quid from an average order value. If you put that on a ROAS strategy, it'll go out and it'll sell those laptops all day long. But what if you've only got two of them left in the warehouse and you've just taken a massive order of 10,000 of those headphones? Well, what's most important to you now is probably starting to shift those headphones. Likewise, um, new customers versus um, existing customers are looking at lifetime value. Um, apparently, Starbucks, I don't know how accurate this is, Starbucks make 50 grand over the lifetime value of a new customer. So getting somebody into that system is worth a fortune to them, whereas they don't want to pay for them to come back time and time again because you're already really loyal. So looking at how much a new customer is worth to you and looking at that lifetime value, again, will help, help you guide the machines to what's most valuable to you. Tip number two, it's already been mentioned, which again is good because it means we're not all talking about different things. Uh, what impacts your business most? So weather. Weather is massive. And I think especially now when, when we've waited like two months for some decent weather, it's impacting us more than it has done before. So we do a lot of work in, for example, the fitted kitchen space. And in that space, when the sun is shining and it's beautiful, we know that we're going to get that call on a Monday that goes, performance is rubbish, what are you going to do about it? It's like, it's just weather. It rains, brilliant, well done, you've improved performance. And it's like, yeah, that's definitely us. Um, but we have a challenge at the minute with a loft boarding company. 
whereby we've onboarded them like really, really recently, so it's quite, quite fresh. And they are saying, uh, what are you guys going to do to make our, um, to get us more conversions? But they've already got something like 88% impression share across the majority of their keywords. And it's just a case of when they plan their targets, they didn't plan it out by seasonality or by month or by Google Trends. They evened it out and divided it by 12 and put it across the year. You then add the hot weather, you add the euros on top of that, and people, can't, people quite frankly can't think of anything worse than going up into their loft, which is probably a little bit like a sauna, um, unless it contains one of those ice baths or something like that. So weather, absolutely massive. Then you've got seasonal demand. So in the fit, fitted kitchen space, uh, Boxing Day is the be all and end all in everything. And then of course, if you are something like a gaming PC, then things like Black Friday or Payday are massive. So you need to know, you need to understand, you need to plan it into your forecast, um, how these macro factors can impact your business. No? There we go. So, laying the foundations. So the fact that the foundations are key has again already been mentioned. Um, but in terms of the signals that you're putting into the platform, I think two of the most important things that we can do when Google's black boxing everything is the creative and then the signals that are going into it. So in terms of the signals, you want to make sure that you're moving along this digital maturity curve. So if you're looking at volume, you're treating all conversions as equal and all conversions are not equal because they have different profitability, different average order values, different margins, different customers. Um, so you want to be moving across to minimum to things like revenue and on a ROAS strategy. And then once you've got your ROAS strategy in, then start thinking about um, your margin and after your margin, think about your lifetime value. We did something again in the fitted kitchen space where when we took over the account, I'm going back about four years ago now, um, they were on a, a CPA strategy and treating all conversions as equal. So, and this is in the lead gen space, not e-com. And their brochures, by the time you worked it all out through the different conversion rates, through to someone buying a kitchen, getting it fitted, the brochures were worth about 250 quid, whereas on the opposite end of the scale, they have five conversion points. It's about two and a half grand if they actually walked into the showroom. So by putting the value against that and putting the value-based bidding in and changing that lead gen strategy from target CPA onto uh, a ROAS strategy, all of a sudden Google went, oh, okay, my path of least resistance suddenly becomes getting a couple of showroom appointments rather than generating a load of brochures and then all of a sudden clients really happy because they're getting the conversion point that's most important to them. So try and sort of move up this curve if you can and work with your data teams and your PPC teams to do that. Um, again, already sort of been touched on. So make sure you are consolidating, but don't over consolidate. So something we've been doing recently is doing the broad and exact into a single campaign, but have those campaigns that are meaningful. I wouldn't necessarily have one campaign that just covers everything broad and everything exact, because then you're not working to what's most important to you. So this one on the right is just a, an example of how that would look with the, uh, the core campaign or the vendor campaign, or you won't be able to see that, but official campaign or the cost campaign, but merge the exact and the broad in there. And the point behind that is data. And it's all about data fueling the AI. The more data you have running through a campaign, the faster it learns, the more it's got to learn from, and the better the performance that you'll see. If you have everything super fragmented, yes, you've got that control, but what you're gonna find is that you haven't got the data for the system to learn. They'll never get out of learning phase and it'll just be super inefficient. Um, one of the uh, slightly cheesy analogies we use at Connective 3 is about like the rocks, the sand, and the pebbles in the jar. So we talk about having your basic account structure uh, through your keywords, through your search campaigns, as the rocks being the exact match. It's where you're going to get probably get a lot of volume through it. Then we talk about the broad match layering in and being the, um, the pebbles. And then we have the, uh, the Pmax as your sand. And it's all about incrementality. So if you, if you know what works, you have those, maybe those shorter search terms and they're your hero terms, make sure you're absolutely maxing out on those. But use things like Pmax, not to take over, not to generate and lean on for your entire performance, but to add that sprinkle of AI to come up with the things that you've never 
that you haven't thought of or you couldn't possibly think of because it's six, seven, eight keywords long um, or eight phrases long. Um, and uh, yeah, so make sure you're capitalizing on every opportunity through using all of those um, match types and campaign types together. And then you've got demand gen. So demand gen is about growing the entire jar um, and creating that demand and increasing your brand search and capitalizing on more and generating audiences that you can then harvest through search and, and sort of so on and so forth. And then uh, just some sort of guidance and sort of tips that we found that work on things like Pmax and demand gen. So don't think of Pmax in terms of having one Pmax campaign, have several Pmax campaigns that all match different objectives. So have your Pmax for new customer acquisition, so that incrementality piece. Have Pmax for retention, Pmax for high value, Pmax for search, as uh, is basically DSA because DSA is going away and it's becoming Pmax for search. Use scripts to understand how your performance is going across each of those. Is it going mostly on search, on shopping? Is it going on video? Is it going on display? And we've been testing putting multiple assets in versus having few assets in versus auto-generated assets in. And to be honest, we haven't found necessarily a single rule for it other than if you put a lot of assets in, what you'll find is all of a sudden you get an awful lot more um, display and YouTube inventory that comes through. And then, apologies for the terrible transition, I copied it, copied it off another slide deck and didn't realize it was there, but it's uh, yeah, pretty cheesy. Um, and then for demand gen, it's completely different. So on this side, you've got almost got like your customer objective, whereas on the demand gen side of things, it's more about the stage in the journey. So again, think of demand gen not as a single campaign, but think of demand gen as almost like your entire Facebook, your entire sort of meta structure pulled across into Google. Um, so you've got your awareness stage, if you're doing that, you've got your consideration for traffic or quality traffic or some sort of soft conversion, whether it's brochures, whether it's product views, um, and then you can have your consideration for conversions and your retargeting. Um, so make sure that you've got all of those um, different pieces in rather than going, oh, I've got a demand gen campaign and I'm expecting it to do drive me sales and conversions. It's like, well, demand gen's about generating demand, it's not about generating sales. So sort of use it in that structure as it's intended and you'll find that it works really well. Um, and then tell Google, tell, tell Google. Um, so you'll never have as rich or as powerful a data set as your own. So make sure that you're using those signals, and again, signals being such an important part of performance these days. Make sure that you're inputting those signals in, whether it's some, through something like Zapier um, and having that direct connection, and whether you're doing those manual uploads. But make sure you're combining your pixel lists and also your CRM lists to make sure that you've got that full view and you're, you're fully utilizing your data um, in the platform. And then again, segmenting. It's not just one list. Have multiple lists. Have people that only buy in a sale. Have people that are your high order value customers. Have people that shop in store versus shop online. And treat those people differently because they'll all have a different worth to you and your campaigns. Um, and then when it comes to things like shopping, make sure that you're taking control of the feed. So have in-stock items. Um, we had a situation with one of our clients where they had overbought on garden furniture. They saw the massive spike in COVID for garden furniture. So amazing, brilliant, let's go and like fill our warehouses with it. But of course, next year, no one wants that. They're all thinking about holidays and doing something different. So they were struggling to sell all their garden furniture. So we put an in-stock label um, onto the stuff that was in the warehouse, um, pushed that, and it wasn't necessarily about generating the highest ROAS, it was about solving the business problem. It was about making sure that they could get rid of that furniture as long as it was a profitable sale, so that they could then fill their warehouses again with sofas and dining tables and the stuff that was their sort of staple. So we did that and then off, off they go again. So make sure that you're listening to your clients and your clients' challenges, but yeah, have a look at it stock, bestsellers, margins, new items, and, and you're sort of labeling them up and using the custom. I think somebody said before, custom labels is your friend, 100% absolutely is. And then omnichannel. Omnichannel is massive and it's only becoming more so. So 55% increase in local searches year on year. And then you've got this sort of similar thing with phone calls. You need to be making sure that you're taking that offline data and plugging it back into Google. Because if Google doesn't know that somebody 
is buying offline, then they're going to think that nobody's buying it and they're going to stop pushing those keywords. Actually, they could be really, really valuable. They could be your highest margin or your highest average order value um, customers, but you don't know it unless you put the data in. So going back to the example of um, sofas and things, a sofa, you're not really going to buy a sofa unless you've sat on it. Um, so you'll find, or we find with one of our clients, they, um, that you will um, search online and then you'll go in store. So you want to have a look, you want to have a look at the stock items they've got, but you'll, you'll, you'll go in and you'll go and sit on it, your kids will jump on it and all that kind of stuff. But unless you're plugging that data back in through enhanced conversions for offline leads or, or um, something like that, then you're missing out on a massive proportion of the pie. So something else to think about. Cool, think like a consumer. This is my own personal favorite. And if you saw my talk at our own Connected Free Up North uh, conference last year, last week, last week um, then it was all about this. It was a whole slide deck just about this. Cool. So we use our um, social bias framework and we implement this on every single one of our PPC clients and it works and it works brilliantly because we're all not as rational as we think. We make 70,000 decisions a day as a person. So anything that we can lean on that tugs on our emotional strings, we're more likely to go, yeah, okay, I'm gonna go with that rather than thinking through things through rationally. And it's all the stuff you see all over booking.com but implemented, I don't know if they're in the room actually, uh, but also like slightly less aggressively than it is on that. So some examples, social proof. Social proof works massively on everything. I'd say social proof and authority bias are the two that we see work the best across e-com and lead gen. And that's just about having that validation to know that what you're buying is the best thing at the best price for you. Uh, and that other people have had that experience. So social proof, easy, trust pilot ratings. Uh, if you're going into things like demand gen, things more visual, you can have quotes by people with the five stars underneath, um, which leans into a bit more like authenticity and things as well. Um, authority bias is things like which best buy or any awards that anybody's run, or if you are in the travel space, it would be like after and at all protected and, and that sort of stuff. Um, you've got the power of now, buy today to get X free or something like that, or flash sales, you know, you've got to buy within the next two days to get this particular deal. Um, category heuristics is interesting. So category heuristics is a shortcut for the brain. Um, and that is almost like if you go into like a travel site, for example, it's things like you might look for 24 hour bar, heated to heated swimming pools, uh, family friendly, etc., etc., And you see those and you go tick, 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 brilliant, that's what I want. And it's about having those, like I say, shortcuts to the brain is the easiest way to think of it. Uh, pain of payment, so you'll see the introduction of Klarna um, and 0% interest free uh, finance and that sort of stuff, just making it really easy. Uh, and we've tested things like um, the total amount for a sofa versus the per month cost and just breaking it down so it seems like it's less for somebody, just taking away that sort of pain of like, oh, that's a lot of money. Um, and then scarcity bias. So scarcity bias is about like only X money left or just today because it's going to be gone by Monday and that sort of stuff. So they all work brilliantly. Guaranteed, you've all, you're, all of your clients have got them and they'll be all over the websites of your clients as well. Just use them in your ad copy, it makes a massive, massive difference. And then also in the creative space, um, people do, we do, everybody tends to do an awful lot of testing on your paid social creatives. There'll be loads of different assets, loads of different videos, loads of different aspect ratios, lo-fi design stuff, all that kind of thing. And then make sure that you leverage that in your Pmax and in your um, demand gem, because it's essentially the same play, uh, the same ad formats and the same campaign types. I once heard the phrase, and I think this is so absolutely bang on, it's something somebody said to me once at a Google, in fact it was a Googler, said it to me at a Google conference, and it was, it's the demand gen is Google's play for the meta budget. And once you hear that, you think, it's so blooming obvious, isn't it? So yeah, honestly, utilize everything that you do in paid social into demand gen. And then once you've got all those different things set, so you've laid the foundations, you've told, told Google what's most important, 
Um, you've got all your data feeding into it, so you've got your signals, you've got your creative, you've got all those kind of bits. Then make sure that you're capitalising on the demand when it's there. To go back to the loft boarding example, the demand is not there. Save it. Save your money for September or October or whenever it rains, which is probably next week. There we go. So, hot weather. When the hot weather comes, either have a weather script in or make sure that by half eight in the morning that you've increased those bids or you've put the seasonal bid adjustment against it to capitalise on the demand that's going to be there. If you're air conditioning units, you're probably valid for two weeks of the British year, maybe. So make sure that you capitalise on it and you take as many of those searches and those conversions as you absolutely can. Black Friday. It's unbelievable that Google does not know what Black Friday is. It sees the, the build up to it. It sees that there's a lot of sales happening, but it doesn't know that Black Friday is a thing until it starts seeing those sales increase. By which point, if you leave the algorithms to it, you've already missed half the day. So you need to be adding your seasonal bid adjustments to say, we expect, um, we expect a change, we expect the conversion rate to increase, we expect lots more sales. And just tell Google, just override it. Um, and then make sure that you have agile budgets as well. So to the point of things like air conditioning or um, ice or leaves or whatever, um, make sure that your client uh, or, or your brand um, is working to a performance metric. So for example, if you want to have a return on ad spend of three and it, that you spend as much as you can until it gets to that point, that's when you start sort of maximizing demand. There's no point if the demand is there at the right profitability, just sort of saying, well, no, actually, we don't want those sales, thank you. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. So make sure you're, you're trying to plan, especially for like 2025, for agile, fluid budgets rather than fixed monthly budgets. <laughs> I think the last slide is a summary slide anyway. There we go. So uh, just in, in sort of summary of all those different bits is, you know, what is most valuable to you? If you don't know, Google doesn't know. Um, then work out the external factors, the macro factors for what's impacting your business. Make sure you've got the setup right, and that's the data setup as much as the campaign setup. Um, tell Google with your own CRM data. Um, think like a consumer and put it onto your ads and your landing pages and things. What would you buy? What would make you buy? Um, and then once you've got all that set up and the conditions are right, maximize it and you'll kill it. And that's me. Thank you.